homesteading is that uh, as a toddler I raised ducks and geese. I have little pictures of myself out in my little diaper hauling water to bunnies. When I was nine, I raised my first bum lamb. When I was 10, I got my first horse. When I was 11, I, I purchased my first um, milk goat. And then from that point on, we lived on a little, uh, uh, I, I guess you could call it a hobby farm. We lived on a little 12 acre farm. We had milk cows, milk goats, beef cows, um, sheep. We had turkeys and geese and ducks and chickens. We had just about everything. And um, the reason why I'm doing a top five tips is because as you age, just because you think that good, healthy, organic food is important doesn't mean that for the rest of your life you're going to want to be hauling water or weeding gardens or irrigating trees. The reason that I'm doing these videos is to try and show my journey from having started the hard way it was, it's a lot of work to farm and, and we've been there. Trying to find a way to set your farm up in, so that as you age, your farm ages and matures and improves to the point where you don't have to take care of it anymore. And so here are my top five tips for beginning homesteaders. First off, keep a homesteading farming journal. Keep a log of all the seed varieties that you've tried, all the breeds of animals that you've tried, the things you liked about them, the things you didn't like about them. And write it all down in the journal. Use it to write a map and a layout of your property. Show where certain things have thrived and certain things haven't thrived. Everything that you do needs to go into this journal and you need to keep it. And you need to make a new journal every year and take the things that did work and transfer them into your new journal and just keep doing that. Every year you need a new journal. And the cuter that you make it, the better. Make it, I, I like to use cardstock as my sheets because then I can uh, glue and tape things. Uh, the brackets that I use are animals, need to order, planted, to do later, done last year, and then a monthly calendar. And I like, I'm a girl, I like to use stickers, I like to make it fun. I like it to be interactive. And then I keep uh, pencils, a uh, hole punches, and scissors and glue in the little pocket. And that's the first thing I would do. Then the next thing is start free. When you decide that you're interested in a certain kind of farming or crafting or homesteading or something, start with free. Look it up on YouTube, look it up on Google, find a way to make it for pennies. I did that with my spinning. This is a Russian spindle, Russian supported spindle, and I have been using drop spindles for lots of years. The first one that I made, I made out of a coaster and a dowel with a little hook on the end. And it didn't work very well, but it taught me to be patient and persistent and whether or not I even liked spinning. Um, and so it allowed me for 25 cents to get started with a fiber craft and yes, I do love it. And so as I got better at it, I bought better tools. Now I have a spinning wheel, but I started out pennies and then I bought a $20 spindle and now I have a $35 spindle that I have found that I love for certain things. And um, the reason that I decided that it was worth investing more in it was because I found the opportunity to make some money with it and it seemed like a good investment at that point, but always start with free. That goes the same for your uh, information resources. Start with the internet, start with the library. If you find yourself going back again and again to the same information at the library, then that's when you know to purchase the book. And try to be as specific and narrow down what your actual target is. If what you want to do is raise backyard chickens, find a book that is about raising backyard chickens. Don't necessarily go and read a book that's about farming chickens in a battery house if what you really want to do is raise them in your backyard. Um, okay. Okay. And the next thing is grow for your own family first. Don't try to start a business from the get go because you're not good at it yet. You don't know if you have the right breed. You don't know if you have access to the feed that you need. Some people are willing to pay an arm and leg for something that was fed free range. Um, 
but along with free range you have to supplement grain if you can't find organic grain and people are insisting that you need organic grain for your feed then you have huge expenses that come into that so find what your family likes to eat and grow that once you know what your family likes to eat then market what people have been asking you for so in, in my instance I have people that would like to buy goat's milk from me or they would like to buy wool products from me and the things that don't take me away from my family too much are the things that I can invest time in however if it's a really laborious thing and it requires a lot of inputs I just won't raise it for anybody but my family the only thing I'll raise for other people is something that I have extra of that doesn't cost me anything um Okay, so if you are the person that wants to homestead in your family and you feel really passionate about it, you need to be really careful not to um, badger and um, manipulate your spouse or your children into caring about it. If you want your family to care about it, find something that they love and incorporate it into your homestead. If you have kids that love bunnies and you really want to incorporate your children into your homestead too, let them raise bunnies and allow the surplus bunnies to be the ones that you sell, but let your kids keep their one specific pet that they love. Use the manure on your garden and um, that can be the niche that your kids have. They don't have to have the same one that you have. And for your husband or your wife, if she loves crafting, introduce her to angora rabbits, introduce her to bum lambs, introduce her to sheep. Um, but you have to be kind, you have to be thoughtful, you have to incorporate them in, in a way that they're interested in it rather than the way that you're interested in it. Be sensitive to that, otherwise you're going to completely turn them off to homesteading. And homesteading has to be a loving family activity, not a belligerent bullying activity by one spouse or parent or the other. Find a way that you can incorporate it into your family rather than it being the sole purpose of your family. And this last one, I believe, is hugely important because it will, it will determine the longevity of your homestead, and it is residual income. And this is one that I have added in since my last video. The first time I heard it talked about, it was Paul Wheaton. And then I did a little more research, and I found, um, oh, what is his name? Darn it. Uh, Salatin, Joel Salatin. Joel Salatin had a little nut business that he started way back when, uh, harvesting nuts for somebody. And he incorporated it into his family and as they did that they had excesses that they were able to trade with other people and they started raising chickens for another family and they, it blossomed into this very large uh, agro business that was also very organic and gentle on the land. And now he writes a book circuit and a speech circuit and now that he's tired and doesn't necessarily want to do the farming, his son has taken over the farm and now he goes and does books and stuff like that now that his body's a little more tired. So the point here is, and what Paul Wheaton says is, find a residual income that you don't have to put inputs into once you have them finished. And what he's talking about is writing articles. Um, making videos, doing podcasts, writing a book, do an ebook, all these things that you make once and then you sell over and over and over and over again. And that is super, super important if you want to make money on a small farm because you don't have the land mass and you don't have the manpower and you don't have the money to put into infrastructure while still raising a small family. But what you can do is take a couple hours a day and write a blog and you can do uh, affiliate links with Amazon that earns you a couple pennies every time somebody clicks on it. And while you are starting off slow, yeah, you're only making pennies and you're definitely not making a minimum wage of any kind, but even somebody that does a blog irregularly or makes YouTube videos irregularly, over time you accumulate an audience and whether or not you are doing it every day, that is a residual income. And if it, you ever decided that you wanted to become more professional and do it every day and really put time and energy into it, you already have that base audience that you can grow from. And in one year, we have managed to go to um, being able to buy all of the feed for our animals and all of my 
trees and all of my nursery seeds, we went from zero to being able to have zero of the homesteading money coming from my husband's job because we're a one income family. Now that I have done a lot of work on that. I, I vlog every day. I have an everyday vlog and then I take those vlogs over time as I as they become really comprehensive and I put them together into how to videos that are meant to really teach you how to do something. Um, and and then recently we did a Kickstarter for the greenhouse. We felt like, Paige, could you please stop making the crinkling noise? Thank you. I'm not. Please stop. I'm not. And then you you have a big enough audience that if you want to do some of these bigger projects to help your business grow, you can. Um, with the Kickstarter, if, if you decide that that's kind of the way you want to go, I would recommend with Kickstarters, make sure you have a large enough audience to support the amount that you're asking for and make sure that it gives back to whatever your audience is supporting. And I lucked out. I really lucked out. I needed the greenhouse because I wanted to do better videos and I have a very very generous audience and I have a few members of my generous audience that really have the funds to be able to help but I worked very 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 hard to make sure that the rewards that I did for that Kickstarter were really worth the money that I was getting because if you do a Kickstarter and what you give back isn't worth what was put in, then the next time you do a Kickstarter, nobody's going to support you because they recognize that what you're giving them back is crap. So um, always give back more than what you take in when you're doing this kind of thing and when you're being audience supported. So that being said, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was as you find that certain animals don't work for your homestead, eliminate them or cut them down to a point where they do work for the homestead. So. For instance, our little egg basket, we keep ducks and chickens. We keep chickens because they eat pests and they are good at um, composting our deep mulch system. And so we keep chickens. However, we can't keep more than about six chickens because then they start to be really hard on the mulch and they dig it up too much and then you, all your water evaporates. So because of that, we also keep ducks. So we keep ducks because they eat the slugs in the deep mulch system and they don't dig mulch up all over the place and their babies are ready to eat in eight weeks, which is as fast as any Cornish cross chicken, but you don't have all the feed that you're putting into a Cornish cross chicken because they're just eating all my slugs and that's how I'm feeding them is with slugs. Um, and then we have goat's milk from our goats and I also use goats to raise my bum lambs that I get for super cheap. And then with the bum lambs, we have um, wool. We have wool that we use to make clothing and that I used as rewards for my Kickstarter. And then when that sheep grows up, we get it pregnant and we butcher its babies when they're three months old and so we have food in the freezer. And then we have ducks. With ducks, I just can't say enough about ducks. I love ducks. We, we pluck them for pillows, we eat them, and when we have eaten them, we drain the fat off from when we cooked them and save it because I don't like homemade butter. I have a butter churn, I have a cream separator, I love them, but I don't like homemade butter. Uh, it has a tendency to go rancid very, very quickly, and I much prefer to cook with lard from our pigs, but my favorite is duck fat and the French cook with it a lot. This is for frying. It is the best thing there ever was. The flavor is incredible. You don't have to use very much. We can go three months with cooking fat from one duck because you get so much grease off a duck. So when people say, oh, duck, yuck, it's greasy, you can cook it in a way so that all the grease comes off of the duck and then you pour the fat into a jar and put it in your fridge and you have cooking fat for the next three months. So. Um, Look for that duality of purpose. Um, we have quail now that we will be raising eggs in the greenhouse from. And I keep them in the greenhouse because it keeps the cats away from them. They will be able to get lots of sunlight. It will be a healthy environment for, for them. And um, so 
pretty much with homesteading, your imagination is the limit. Whatever you believe that you think is possible that you don't see anybody else doing, try it. Make it work. Write a book. Have residual income for your old age and feel empowered because you did something out of nothing. You did something nobody else has done. And that's amazing and that's fantastic. Um, the other thing that we're doing is that as the girls have gotten a little older, they have wanted to be able to do certain things that we don't have money for. We are a single income family. I homeschool, so a lot of my time that I could be using to create things that would create money, I'm actually supervising my children, doing homeschool, little bits of farming here and there. And so uh, for the girls, anything that they want to do recently, they wanted to take writing lessons, and so I negotiated with them and they are the ones that stack the wood and they are the ones that clean the house. Everything that needs to be done, they load and unload the dishwasher, they do laundry, they wash counters, they do vacuuming, they're the ones that do it. They're five and eight. However, they just, we were just given a pony by a, a friend and um, they now have to purchase hay so they need a little more money and we don't have the money to give to them. So, what we have done is they already had uh, good skills in sewing. This is Kaya's from when she was three. And Paige is uh, learning how to use a loom. She's making hot pad holders. So what we've done is we've done up an Etsy store for them. And we have uh, told our subscribers that if they would like to purchase from the girls these items, then that money just goes to the girls. And so that is how we are teaching our kids how to be responsible with their own money and to recognize the value of money. And the nice thing is, is that with an income, you may not walk away, thank you. With an income, it means that if they are careless or disobedient or destructive, we have something to pull from to be able to fix what it is they break, which if you have little kids, you recognize that that happens a lot. Um, Paige shot an arrow through our basement window and that window needs to be fixed. So where does that money come from? Well, when she has finished her work, she has money and that's where we pull the money from. Um, the other day Paige took a whole bunch of very expensive quail food, it's almost $18 a bag, out and tried to feed it to the cats. And this was the second time she'd done something like that in a week. The first time we find her $2, just enough for the amount that she had wasted. But then we found that she had done it again and this time she had purposely taken a bucket of it and gone and thrown it out in the backyard where it will dissolve and not be of any use to anything. So this time we charged her the full price of a bag, hoping that this time she would recognize the cost. And so homesteading is really good for teaching kids life skills and responsibility, and it gives you kind of an out as a parent that um, they're not stuck in a house on video games or watching TV. We don't have a television. Um, it, it really teaches their kids to dig deep and learn how to entertain, but not only entertain, how to support their own dreams. And so that's one of the things that we really love about homesteading. And um, so our websites are edibleoasisidaho.blogspot.com, and I'll put the link below. That's our blog. We do have uh, Amazon affiliate links there which means that if we have something that we have used that we love that we thought was worth spending the money on we put it on Am on an Amazon link so you could go see it and we do get paid a couple pennies for that um, and that was the other thing I wanted to talk about and I forgot uh, step number two um, when you're starting out and you're starting free yes definitely go free if free doesn't work go to the cheap option and see if that will work. If that doesn't work, go to the expensive option as long as it's effective. If it's an effective tool, it's worth spending the extra money on once you've tried the other two avenues. And so there are things on our homestead that we spent a lot of money on. I have a scythe that costs $350, but it works. It's amazing. It's an Austrian scythe from, I think, Scythe Connection or something, or Scythe Works. And it's really from Austria, and it's 50 years old, and it's worth having. Um, and I did start out with a cheap one. And I did, before that, I started out with a weed whacker that I already have, but I can't harvest hay with the weed whacker. And the crappy $50 scythe was damaging to your body rather than supportive. So those are the kind of the incremental steps that you take. So, edibleoasisidaho.blogspot.com is our blog. 
and then we have Etsy. We're Dirt Patch Heaven on Etsy, and the only things I have up there are the girls' items to make it. It doesn't take all of my time away from the farming or from the knitting that I'm doing as the rewards for the Kickstarter. So sewing is actually a lot easier for me. And we'll probably have more items up there eventually, but for now, it's just the girls trying to pay for hay for their pony. And then what else have we had? And of course, we're Dirt Patch Heaven at YouTube. Do we have any other sites? Uh, if, if I missed any of my sites and you Mr. guys... Dirt. Yeah, and Mr. Dirt. Um, my husband's YouTube channel is Mr. Dirt where he talks about reloading and he likes to rant a lot. So if you like manly rants, go to Mr. Dirt on YouTube. Um, and then if you like beauty, uh, let's see, that one is Natural Happy at on YouTube. Natural Happy on YouTube. I have more girly... Uh, organic makeup type stuff. Wow, that sounds like an awful lot of sites. No wonder I'm tired. Um, so, and if you want the more comprehensive video about um, homesteading, that one is called How to Homestead and then in Paren, The Smart Way. And that one I did a year ago, but I really wanted to go into the residual income. You have no idea how good it feels after all these years of homesteading and just feeding my family with all of this farming uh, surplus, how good it feels to actually be making money to support our farm and hopefully eventually not just support our farm, but to become a real source of income above and beyond the farm, not just for now, but for in years later. And hopefully that was all comprehensive and not boring. So we will talk to you guys later.